I'd like to welcome. Uh, my name is Joan Balk. I'm one of the adult programming librarians for the St. Mary's County Library. And tonight we, were, we will be meeting another author. It's Emily Catiano. And we are um, also going to be talking about this year's One Maryland, One Book, which is the Island of Sea Women. And this program, the One Maryland, One Book program, has been in existence for about 13 years. And the objective um, with Maryland Humanities is that they choose a book so that they can encourage people not only to read, but that they can talk and be with one another through book clubs. So that's the whole idea behind it. So each year as librarians, we try to do programs. And this year, the One Maryland One book um, that was written by Lisa C., there are over 200 programs taking place in the state. So um, I have the honor of, Lisa, of introducing Emily tonight, but I was very lucky when we were trying to decide what program to have in St. Mary's County, I just started Googling on the internet and I found this interesting article that Emily had written for Roads and Kingdom. And Emily is a writer. Uh, she's written many short stories, but she's also a journalist and she's done a lot of traveling. And as luck would have it, Emily had traveled to the island of Jeju. For those of you who have read the book, that's where the story takes place. And she had actually been able to meet some of the Henya and um, write this article for Roads and Kingdom. So I sent her an email and she has graciously agreed to talk to us this evening and tell her all about her experience there. So I'm just as excited as you are. So with, um, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Emily to you and we'll take it from there. Great. Thank you so much, Joan. And thank you so much for having me and inviting me to be part of this program. Um, hi everyone, it's nice to meet you. Um, as Joan said, my name is Emily. I am a writer and journalist. Um, I also am a teacher of writing. I run a um, adult education creative writing school called the Redbud Writing Project in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is where I currently live, although I am originally from New England. So um, tonight I'm going to be talking about a few different things. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, how I ended up writing about the Hanyeo on Jeju, um, a little bit about my experiences um, speaking with the Hanyeo that I interviewed. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I observed about Jeju that rang true um, from the book, The Island of Sea Women. Um, then I'm going to read um, an excerpt from the article that I read, since authors usually read excerpts from their books during um, these kinds of events. I figured I could read something for you all. Uh, and then I'll show you some photographs of my time on the island, um, just so you can get a visual for some of the um, elements that I'm talking about, and of course some of the places, people, and cultures that are discussed in the book. Um, and then finally, of course, we will have time for questions. So. Um, I will get started talking about how I ended up writing about um, the Hanyeo and Jeju. So um, I travel a lot, it's a passion of mine. My husband is, shares that passion, so um, since we've met, we've been traveling a lot together. And um, whenever I travel, I really like to look for ideas for things to report on. Um, I'm a freelance journalist, which means um, I do not belong to any one specific organization. Um, I come up with ideas and research them and then pitch them to editors who I think might be interested. Um, and then ideally I end up um, getting a piece published with, with that editor. So, um, you know, in the past I have reported on a man in Mexico who was making fake Coca-Cola in a small village. Um, I reported on the last fish tannery in Iceland. And I really love um, pursuing these reporting ideas while I travel because they really deepen the experience for me. Um, they allow me to meet people and have experiences that I would not usually have as a tourist, um, as you will learn from my story about meeting the Hanyeo. Um, and it allows me to combine my passion for traveling with my passion for writing and interviewing um, and getting to talk to different people who've had different life experiences. Um, and of course, it makes me some money to help pay for my trips, which is never a bad thing. <laughs> Um, so, how did I come up with this idea and get connected with um, Jay Che, who is the Han Yeo, who I interviewed for the article? Um, my husband, um, Nate, we'll just use his name since he comes up a lot in the story, um, is friends with a woman named Hong, who he met on study abroad in Shanghai about uh, 10 years ago at this point. 
So Hong grew up on Jeju. She comes from a Jeju family. Um, her family goes back many generations on this island. Um, in 2016, Nate and I were traveling to China so that he could show me the places where he had visited on study abroad um, and practice his Mandarin language skills. And we decided to go visit Hong on Jeju. So um, before we left, I decided that I really wanted to try to report on something on Jeju. And I messaged Hong, who I had met before, and asked her, um, what are the most interesting aspects of your island? This is a question that I always ask people when I'm trying to gather story ideas, because usually people have something that they're the most passionate about, about their culture or their homeland or their job or what have you. Um, and her immediate response was, oh, the Henye are the most interesting people on my island. I said, oh, who are the Hanyeo? So I started researching and I really knew right away that I wanted to write about them. I love stories about communities of women. I love stories about the ocean. So, and I love stories about um, unique cultural practices. So this story really hit a lot of buttons for me. So um, I did some research and saw that there had been a lot of articles already written about the how, how the Hanyeo are a dying tradition. And as you um, saw, if you read the book, The Island of Sea Women, you know that this has been a narrative that's been around for some decades. Um, people have been saying that the Hanyeo tradition was going to die out. And it does seem statistically that it likely will within the next few generations at most. But I wondered if there could be a buck the trend kind of journalistic piece to write if I could find a young Hanyeo, somebody around my age, who unlike everybody in her generation had decided to pursue this traditional career path. So um, I asked Tong, who apparently knows everybody on Jeju. She's very, very proud um, of her island and its heritage. And she's very passionate about sharing its culture and history with, um, with other people. She um, was able to find this Hanyeo who was in her early thirties and set up a meeting. Um, so in general, it's not very easy to talk with Hanyeo on Jeju. Um, they have a tourist performance that they give um, so that people, they can capitalize a little bit on their growing international fame. And as you saw in the book, um, that, that kind of tourism and um, cashing in on that, um, that fame for the Hanyeo was already something that people were starting to do um, even in the late 20th century. But besides that, in my experience, what I understand, they don't really love to have random strangers come up to them and start peppering them with questions. So I was lucky to have Hong as an intermediary and somebody who was able to both make this introduction and make this meeting happen, but also to act as a translator because I don't speak Korean and um, JHA does not speak English. So Hong was able to um, act as the linguistic intermediary between us as well. Um, so I, um, Using Hong as a translator, I met Jay Che in a cafe. Um, as you will see if you read my article, um, there is sort of a um, stereotype of the Hanyeo is very gruff and tough. And it was interesting to me, having read about that stereotype, to meet Jay Che because she was very shy, very kind. Um, obviously, her profession is very physically difficult and very taxing. And I'm sure she's a very strong person, but she came across as very approachable and sweet, which I thought was quite interesting, again, considering the stereotype that you hear about Hanyeo. So um, as I said, if you're curious how the article and interview turned out, I will read a bit from it later. Um, but now I want to move to um, a slightly different topic, which is what did I observe about Jeju that rang true from the book? Um, I was telling Joan that I just read the book this week in preparation for this talk, and there were several elements in there that really um, resonated with me in my brief but very memorable experience traveling on the island. So um, one element that I wanted to touch on is the view um, of the view that Jeju um, residents have about their own island, their own traditions, and their view about outsiders. So as you all um, gathered from the book, Jeju is a, a very singular place. It has very special nature, very um, individual history and a strong tradition and a lot of pride as such small, strong cultural places tend to have. So uh, my friend Hong, who again grew up on Jeju and comes from a Jeju family, um, loves her home, was very enthusiastic about showing me around. In fact, when I first met Hong the previous year when she came to visit me when I was living in Germany, she um, 
talked up Jeju so much that I was like, I really want to go to this place someday. I've never even heard of it before. So um, she was really a good um, saleswoman for her homeland. And um, again, that rang true from the book when um, you read about all these characters who are really proud of the place where they come from and really proud of all the traditions and all the elements that make Jeju unique, not just in the world, but in contrast to the rest of Korea as well. Um, another element that's connected to that that I noticed is the um, suspicion of in view of outsiders. It seems sort of complicated to me, wherein tourism is a huge, huge um, driver of income on Jeju. And people there are, on the one hand, very, very um, enthusiastic about sharing their traditions and culture with new people and sort of proselytizing about how wonderful Jeju is to the rest of the world. But there also is some worry about outside forces changing the island, as again you saw in the book with the characters resenting Japanese colonizers and then the American influences over their island after the end of World War II. Um, so I noticed when I was in Jeju that there was a lot of talk about pollution blowing in from China and how the strong winds on Jeju were bringing in um, this bad air from Shanghai, from the Chinese mainland. And people were grumbling about that and worrying that maybe there were too many tourists coming from China um, because there's this policy where Chinese folks could visit Jeju without a visa, which um, contributed to tourism, of course, but made people in Jeju worry that their island was changing and perhaps there was too much influence being exerted once again by a very strong outside power that was not the people of Jeju. So I thought that was really interesting that in some respects, these conversations that took place throughout the 20th century were still taking place in the 21st when I visited. Um, and something else connected with Jeju's history that really resonated with me was the memories of the 4-3 incident on Jeju, which Again, those of you who have read the book will remember this was the uprising that led to months and months of massacres of people in Jeju who were expected, suspected of being rebels or communists. Um, and when I first met Hong in Europe the year before I went to Jeju, she told me about this incident on maybe the first or second day that I'd known her. And I have to confess that I had never heard of it before. And um, hearing about it from her, I was completely blown away that this horrible thing had happened, that American military had been on the island and had done nothing about it, and I had never even heard of it. Um, so I think that both shows how the fact that Hong brought this up so soon after meeting me showed how um, vivid that incident still is for the people of Jeju. Again, as you saw in the book, that really overshadowed everybody's lives after it happened. Um, and it also made me think a lot about how um, I hope that I can work to be more aware of other people's histories and tragedies as an American. And I think that um, one wonderful thing about this book and in reading reviews of it, I think this was part of Lisa C's int intention is to um, draw awareness to the history of this island, to the horrible thing that happens there within my grandparents' lifetime, and um, to get people thinking a little bit more about the history and culture of places that they may not be familiar with. Um, so with that, I am going to read a little part of the article for you all. Bear with me while I um, pull this up here. So um, a little bit of backstory here. Um, Jay Che, the um, Hanyeo who I interviewed in the cafe, was um, working as a hairdresser in the capital of South Korea. She left home on Jeju like most people in her generation. She said, oh, I'm not going to be a Hanyeo. Nobody does that anymore. And um, after a few years in Seoul, she said, I really don't like this. I'm hustling all the time. There's no... Um, social support for me as a single mother. Maybe if I return to Jeju, I can become a Hanyeo and my life will be easier, which is sort of a crazy subversion of the narrative because all throughout um, 20th century, we hear, heard about in the book how being a Hanyeo was so difficult and so dangerous and um, how the pay was so um, nebulous and how so easy to die under the ocean. So it's very interesting to me that Jay Che chose this life and thought that in some ways it might be easier than modern life in a huge metropolis. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and read a little bit here from the middle of the article. <clears throat> Jeju is a subtropical island, roughly 700 square miles of volcanic rock and soil off the Korean peninsula's southern tip. 
Its center is dominated by a snow-topped volcano, Mount Hala, and along its coasts, cliffs of hexagonal basalt stones jut into the dull turquoise sea. The air is cool but humid, the water tepid. At night, the lights of squid boats glimmer offshore. The island has always maintained its own distinct culture, dialect, and shamanistic traditions, despite centuries of colonization and violence, most notably the Jeju uprising of 1948, when mainland Korean forces, intent on purging communists from the island, killed tens of thousands of civilians. Throughout it all, as the men of the island fought or languished in prison, the Hanyeo remained the island's economic and cultural bedrock. These days, Jeju is known for its fishing industry, its yearly Mandarin orange crop, and tourism. Todd Thacker, chief manager at the Jeju Tourism Organization, says that although people don't come to Jeju specifically for the Hanyeo, the sight of these divers working up and down Jeju's shores is a memorable part of the landscape for many visitors. The coastline is dotted with beachside shacks where Hanyeo tidally slice into squirming fish's gills. Outside one shack, live sea cucumbers and conches in their gnarled shells sit in red and turquoise baskets while fish float in an adjacent tank. An old Hanyeo float, white instead of orange, hangs with its net in the corner. Lunch is served at long picnic benches near a heater and includes a plate of thinly sliced raw white fish eaten with thick onions, wasabi, soy sauce, and red chili pepper paste. The second course is mayun tang, a hot fish stew served on a tabletop gas stove, along with the traditional Korean sides that arrive with all meals, kimchi, radishes, pickled cucumbers. Every day, a group of Hanyeo show off their traditional songs and diving practice for tourists at Sunrise Peak, a green-limbed volcanic tuft cone jutting off the island's eastern coast. Che lives and dives nearby in the Samdal region. At work, she wears yellow flippers and a black wetsuit and carries a turquoise net attached to a bright orange float that looks like a pumpkin. She dives off seaweed moist basalt rocks into the shallows then quickly paddles away from shore, her face in the water. On her way out, she dips down every few meters, her flippers graceful in the air as she checks the bottom. In less than a minute, she's far away, a black rubber hood on the choppy water. <clears throat> After she dives, only her orange float remains, bobbing on the chilly sea. It's taken her four years to reach this point. One cannot simply decide to become a Hanyeo and jump into the ocean. Instead, the traditional Hanyeo culture that so defines Jeju relies heavily on both cooperation and hierarchy. In Che's village, 13 women currently work as Hanyeo, the oldest age 87. These Hanyeo are divided into three levels. The bottom level, the Hagun, includes beginners and older women, while the top level, Sangun, is comprised of women like Che's mother, who can dive into the most difficult and treacherous territory. To become a Hanyeo, Che had to earn a yes vote from every woman in her village. Everyone approved her, except her mother. Once Che convinced her mom that she was serious about her ambitions, she started training. It takes a new Hanyeo like Che five years to achieve full competency. At this point, she's a Jungyun, the middle level, and can dive 20 feet down and hold her breath for between 40 seconds and a minute. Her mother, as an expert, can reach depths of more than 30 feet. Che doesn't shy away from talking about the difficulties of her new life. The Hanyeo export most of their products, especially turban shells, to Japan, where they are considered a delicacy. This means, however, that they're beholden to the vicissitudes of the international seafood market. They can survive through a combination of diving and farming on the side, but their salaries are not what anyone would call luxurious. A Hanyeo can dive from sunrise until lunch gathering sea urchins, then spend the rest of the day prying them open. For the whole day's work, she would typically make about 17,000 yuan, the equivalent of about $17. It's not just the low pay for long hours either. The Hanyeo dives six hours a day, approximately 18 days per month, depending on the weather and tide conditions. Che says she didn't realize before she became a Hanyeo that the women take pills to cope with motion sickness. 
which is compounded by the stink of their rubber suits and the disorienting fogging of their masks. Pushing through these conditions, says Che, takes a certain mindset, the same mindset that has made Han Yeo the anchor of Jeju society for centuries. Che experienced this feeling at the beginning of her career when she brought home seafood she had harvested to her youngest child who ate them and said he wanted more. She knew then that she was hooked. It's greedy, but it's not the bad greedy, Che says. It's, I want to catch these things more and I want to feed my family. If I catch this, maybe I can send my kids to academy schools. That's kind of a woman diver's thinking. But most importantly, Han Yeo must be careful not to push too far. Spending much time beneath the sea, deprived of oxygen, can lead to fatal heart problems. In 2014, nine Han Yeo died while diving. They have to use faith to know when to stop, to have enough breath to come up slowly, to not take too much time to grab that final sea urchin or abalone that's stuck under the rock. To justify spending so much time in the dangerous ocean, the Han Yeo recite an old saying, we make money in the world after death while holding our breaths. And if we're lucky, we come back to our world to spend it. So I'll stop there. Um, as you can probably tell though, there were many um, parallels between the Han Yeo today and some of the challenges and triumphs that they face and experienced and um, the Han Yeo challenges and triumphs that we saw in the island of sea women. So um, I just wanted to quickly touch on two other parts of the article that I didn't get to read, but that I think are important and instructional to think about. So um, one is something that I touched on earlier when I talked about Jay Che's story, which is the fact that she um, stopped being a hairdresser and uh, became a Hanyeo because she wanted more social support for herself and her kids. Um, to me, this raises interesting questions about modern life and the lack of social support and community that one might experience in a big city. Obviously, her life as a Hanye was very difficult, but being part of the collective back in her village does afford her um, some of the social support that she lacked when she was living on her own in the big city. Um, the other element that I wanted to bring up is the fact that um, there is a force that is hurting the Han Yeo besides the fact that there's waning interest in becoming one of these diving women. Um, they are also threatened because of the changing sea due to climate change. Um, Jay Che told me that even when she started, women were already talking about the undersea landscape changing, more bacteria, warming waters. She said that um, specifically abalone, which you probably remember from the book, is a very valuable shell, and it still is a very valuable shell. Um, the abalone are disappearing from the waters around Jeju now, and she said that catching one is like winning the lottery for her. So uh, I wanted to bring that up since obviously that's not really discussed in the book since it's mostly about the 20th century when climate change was not really on people's radars um, as another interesting and tragic element to um, the story of the Han Yeo in the 21st century. So um, the last thing that I want to do before I open this up to questions um, and comments from everybody is to show you all some vacation photos from Jeju so that you can get a bit of um, a set of visuals to go along with everything that I've talked about. So um, I'm going to pull up my pictures here and then I'll do a screen share and um, I hope you'll forgive me for the many tabs that I have open since I have a problem with opening too many tabs. <laughs> um, all right, so um, this first picture here is on a second. Um, so this is Hong, my friend, who I have um, been talking about through the course of this discussion. Um, this is me, as you can see, I had very short hair four years ago. So um, this is the Han Yeo shack that I talked about in the story where um, we got to eat delicious um, slices of raw white fish. As you can see, I'm really chowing down on that um, with these different sauces. And this is the um, gas grill that um, was waiting for the fish stew to come along. I think I have a picture of that in here as well. Um, so again, the shack is run by Han Yeo and they use this as a place to sell their seafood both to tourists and locals who might be interested in having a nice um, special lunch by the shore. Um, let's see, this is um, a special um, millet rice liquor that's popular on Jeju. Um, as you probably remember from the book, alcohol is a pretty common part of Korean culture and um, in my experience that was definitely still part of Jeju culture today. Um, this is Jeju City. 
Um, I was telling Joan before um, the presentation started, it's definitely been modernized. As you can see, there's cars, there's roads, there's apartment buildings. Um, I got a Dunkin' Donuts coffee while I was there. So the outside world has definitely come to Jeju in that respect. Um, and as you can see, you know, they talked in the book about um, the modernization of the architecture on Jeju, and this definitely happened pretty can fully. On can the I island. interrupt you for a second? Sure. Uh, all I see on the screen is the picture. I still see the picture of you and Hong eating, but I haven't seen the the next picture. Oh, okay. Um, is that hmm. Mm -hmm. once if you popped it out in the new window, you probably have to stop the share and reshare the. Gotcha, the gotcha. One second here. I think I might have accidentally shared that one window. Are you all seeing the list of yes individual photos here? Yes. And now the new photo. Now, now it's working. Awesome. Joan, thank you for stopping me and pointing that out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so um, just to quickly recap, this is um, this bottle of rice millet wine that, that I got to try on Jeju. Um, this is Jeju City, um, definitely modernized from what it was like 60 years ago. Um, this is the, the um, food, sorry, these pictures are a little bit out of order, but this is the um, fish stew that they heated up on that gas stove at the table. Um, I compare this shack a little bit to like when you go to New England and you get like fried clams by the beach. It's a little bit like that, except obviously connected with this very ancient culture. Um, let's see here. This was um, a dessert that's ice with um, bean juice, sweet bean juice on it. Pretty tasty. Um, Oh, and this is Mount Hala. Um, what was really interesting to me is that um, the top of the mountain was very cold and snowy, um, but the bottom of the mountain felt very tropical. So that was something that's really cool to me about the landscape on Jeju, that it's so varied. Um, it's a bit like Hawaii in that respect, is another volcanic Pacific island, um, having this wide variety of different um, temperatures and climates. And um, again, to reference the book, this is the mountain that all the characters talk about as being very sacred um, and like a goddess over them. And this is also the central part of the island um, where the rebels would have been hiding out um, in the course of the conflict between um, the rebels and the South Korean government. Um, oh, and this is one of the crows that are all over Jeju. Again, that's mentioned in the book. Not surprised by how cold and snowy it was up there. <laughs> um, these are and this is the more tropical landscape at the bottom of the mountain. This is um, the lava tube caves that you can tour. Um, again, in the book, the teenage girl character complains about how it's like stupid that her parents make her go to see these lava caves. I thought it was cool. <laughs> um, I guess it's hard to impress a teenage girl sometimes, but um, this is a view of the um, ocean. This was in January and it looks pretty cold, so you can understand why the Hanye will have to be really tough and um, really able to train themselves to withstand harsh conditions and cold climates. This is um, another view of the fish and the sauce. And um, this is, they have a tank of fish outside the shack. And in fact, they had a Hanye sitting just there, um, slicing up the fish, just right there and then sending them into plates on the rest at the restaurant. Um, then this is another um, peak on the um, southeastern tip of the island. As you can see, Hong was struggling a little bit here to get up the stairs. <laughs> um, and then you can see this view out over um, this part of the island. Um, I included this picture because, um, again, in the book, they talk about how some of the modernization of the island made it a little bit not not quite as beautiful as perhaps some thatched roofs might have been and you know we could see from this picture that some of the um, new structures that they built were a little bit drab and perhaps not as scenic and beautiful as um, some of the old um, traditional houses that they had a hundred years ago. Um, there's Hong showing her pride for her home island. Um, and this is Jay Che, the um, Han Yeo, who I interviewed. Um, as you can see, she's a very kindly looking soul. Um, just met and talked in this cafe for many hours, which was lovely. Um, this is on the south side of Jeju. You can see these beautiful basalt cliffs and this um, really bright water. It's a little bit reminiscent of Hawaii, but a bit more subtropical than, than tropical. 
Um, then this is um, a temple that we visited um, along that same strip of the coast. You can see um, some of the interesting religious graffiti that we saw there. This is just to give you a little bit more of a sense of the landscape and what the, what the ordinary bits of the islands look like. Um, and then that is it. So um, I think I will stop there and um, we can open it up to comments and questions. All right, so if everyone, let me start my video again. I'm gonna uh, give everyone a chance to ask a question. If you would like to just go um, and raise your hand or uh, ask Emily anything or me anything, that would be great. I, I don't wanna start because I'm afraid I'm gonna take over the uh, whole conversation, but does anybody have anything to ask Emily before we get started? I don't know how to raise my hand, Joe. Okay, Jane, I, I see that you have unmuted yourself, so go ahead. I wondered where I could find her article to read. I just put it up in the chat. If you go down to the bottom of your screen and click on the icon that says chat, mm -hmm. that will bring the chat screen up on the right side of your page. Okay, and there you have listed it. And yeah, under roads and kingdoms. And the article, what's impressive about the article is she has pictures. Emily has put pictures in there. Emily, do you want to tell them a little bit about how you got the photographs for the um, article? Sure. And you know, why don't I pull up the article and screen share and I can show the pictures for those from there for those who have not had a chance um, to see them. So um, I once I'm not a professional photographer. Um, I just take pictures for fun. So when I returned to the States and um, placed the article with an editor, she said, well, we really need professional photographs of JJ diving. And um, there's a fair number of Americans who live on Jeju these days, actually, um, who get jobs there teaching English. And so I just did some Googling and found an American photographer there who usually does weddings and such, but also has an interest in more journalistic um, photojournalism work. And um, he was thrilled when I asked him if he could do this because he had always wanted an excuse to meet the Hanyeo and to approach them and talk to them, which I think just goes to show you that you can live on Jeju and it can still be difficult um, to come across one of these storied women. So he met Jay Che and went out and um, took these pictures. Um, and I think they came across really really lovely so I will like I said go ahead and just scroll through and show you can everybody see this yes great um so yeah this is um you know, as you can see she's out on these um volcanic rocks this is the float that she uses so that people can identify where she is um the net and the bag where she keeps her um her catch the wetsuit, of course, um, these days they wear wetsuits and not those like thin white cloth outfits that they were wearing in the book. Um, let's see. JJ and her mom, the one who voted against her being allowed to become a Hanyeo, which I think it's kind of funny, getting ready to dive in. She has this knife, as you can see, for, um, you know, slicing things off rocks. And then here they are swimming out. Um, and you can see Jay Che sort of taking a look at her catch here on the rocks. And hauling the net back in. And oh, here are the abalone. She won the lottery that day by, um, by catching some of these rare abalone. And those are all the pictures that are in there. So um, yeah, I think he did a great job and I'm glad that I could give him an excuse to go talk to some of the Hanyeo too. Do the women, you know, in the book, they they talked about how the, the women divers had to take their catch and the Japanese would take part of their profits. Mm -hmm. Do they, when they bring in their catch of the day, are they selling it to that restaurant right there or is so a truck coming and loading it on the truck or what? So in terms of the restaurant, my understanding is that they actually own the restaurant. The collective owns the restaurant. So it's sort of their way of just selling the product directly to consumers right there by the shore. Um, in terms of how the product is then moved to Japan or other, to other 
parts of the world. I'm not quite sure how the supply chain, the details of how the supply chain works. I mean, I would imagine they transport it to Jeju City somehow and then fly it on out. But um, I unfortunately didn't get to see all the back end details of that. What I thought was interesting about your pictures, they're beautiful pictures. Well, yours are beautiful and so are the photographers that he took for the article. But um, for anyone who read the book, you notice the difference they have, the, if you read the article, it talks about how the women now have insurance, they have health insurance now. And I think the government wanted, had offered them that they could use oxygen tanks and they don't want to use the oxygen tanks. But before where they didn't have, um, you know, they didn't have those um, wetsuits. Now they have the wetsuits. Now they have the mask. They're not going to be bitten by the sea snakes or, you know, the, um, not the, the jellyfish. And I think it's amazing to see the difference, but that doesn't necessarily make the women happy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that's worth pointing out that they, they were, they were satisfied with what they had before, but as time has gone on, all these changes have affected them, but it's not necessarily making them happy. So I think that's interesting. For sure. And the bit about the oxygen tanks, I think is fascinating to me because you would think, well, of course, why wouldn't they want an oxygen tank, right? It makes you safer. It makes you better able to dive and gather more. But they said, no, if we have oxygen tanks, we'll just take everything and then there'll be nothing left next year or in five years. So mm -hmm. it sort of showed me how in tune they are with the balance and um, the restraint necessary to keep this profession alive for centuries and centuries. And it does make me hope that it will endure into the subsequent generations too. But I guess we'll have to wait and see. I think it's interesting that you mentioned the shamanistic views that, that they, they have kept their culture as mm -hmm. much as they could think, oh, if we bring more in, we'll make more money, you know, we'll, we'll get bigger houses, whatever. They haven't, they haven't changed. Do you think the amount of money that they're making per day has changed? Has that increased over time? I mean, I know, of course, it increases over time, but in relation to the, the year that they're in, has that increased? Um, you know, I can't say for sure. Um, I would imagine that it's increased just because Korea has become a wealthier country in general. Um, and obviously people, or maybe not obviously, but in my impression, people are not living in substance poverty the way they were in the 1930s, for example. Um, but it's still not as though they are extremely wealthy. Um, you know, they're not going around and pulling out million dollar abalones every day or something such. But so my impression is that their fate has, um, bettered as the fate of the rest of Korea has bettered somewhat. So like J. Chase, she, she wasn't becoming a henya because she thought she'd make more money. She just wanted this, the support. Exactly. They, exactly. And she was really unhappy taking the subway, schlepping on the subway every day to work and feeling like she was surrounded by strangers, no one to take care of her kids. So she returned more for her own happiness and the social support um, that she knew she would get as being part of that collective. How big is the island in terms of miles? I mean, if you look at it on a world map, it's very teeny, but from your right. opinion, it looks big. I think I read that it's 10 times the size of Manhattan or so. So it's not huge, but it took us about an hour to drive from the north to the south side. So it's a good chunk of an island. It's not, um, it's not huge, but it's not, it's not super tiny either. And were you able to fly right to the island or did you have to take a ferry from Korea, from South Korea? No, I've actually not been to the South Korean mainland. Um, we just, there's a direct flight from Shanghai that takes about an hour and a half. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of Chinese tourism these days. So it, the plane was packed. <laughs> Makes sense. There's, there's a lot, a lot of people going back and forth. That's really interesting. Now I noticed in your, um, when I read your biography that you talked about um, that you write short stories. So could you tell us a little bit about your writing and uh, your teaching for the Red Book writing project? 
Sure. Um, so yeah, I do um, write fiction as well as nonfiction, which I think is pretty common for journalists. A lot of us have a novel or two in us. And um, I, I, you know, there's a lot of overlap between my interests as a reporter and my interests as a fiction writer. I love writing about women. I love writing about communities of women. I love writing about people doing unusual or strange or exciting things like diving into the sea. Um, so yeah, and, you know, I always say that my research as a reporter just enhances and complements my fiction work because it's always something new and interesting coming into my mind coming from the real world and then you can change it and make it fiction um and uh yeah in terms of the red bud writing project i um graduated from my mfa program a year and a half ago in raleigh and um i wanted to continue teaching creative writing which i'd had the opportunity to do during my grad program and um, I co-founded uh, an adult education creative writing school with um, a friend of mine in Raleigh. And um, our purpose was to bring writing education to everybody, not people who are affiliated with universities, um, not people who are in degree seeking programs, but just any adult who wanted to learn how to write nonfiction or fiction, or perhaps was already writing and wanted a community in which to workshop and get feedback and hone their craft and find um, a group of writing friends. So um, we started teaching these classes and um, now we've worked with hundreds of students and um, we're now online, of course, because of the pandemic as everything is online these days. Um, but it's a really rewarding part of my career trifecta. If we can con consider my career trifecta to be writing, reporting and teaching um, to get to help other students um, find nonfiction stories or fiction stories to tell and help them um, elevate their voice and their craft so that they can tell them in the most effective way possible. So we have also put that up in the chat. If anybody's interested, we've put the link for the Red Bud, Red Bud, Red Bud writing up. So any of us could take the courses, right? Indeed, yes. Well, that's great. Um, and we actually have decided, even when things go back to normal, we're going to keep some online classes because we've gotten feedback from people who might be working parents or live far away from Raleigh that they really appreciate the opportunity to take a class. So we're happy that we've at least gotten to develop some online curriculum, gotten one good thing out of this um, yeah. challenging year. <laughs> now, do you find now that you're doing the uh, teaching and you're writing your short, short stories, do you, do you do one or the other? Does it have to be one or the other where you think, okay, I'm putting all my efforts into writing these short stories so I don't have time to write articles that mm -hmm. I have to sell to magazines. Do you think it's harder now? Um, no, I, you know, I actually think it's almost the opposite for me. Um, I think I, when I'm working on one thing, it makes me more excited to work on more things. So it's almost like a cumulative it's like a snowball, if you will, um, as opposed to if I'm not busy enough, then it's easy to just have the whole day further away with one task that I'm putting off. So, um, yeah, I mean, I definitely know people who um, don't have time to pursue their own writing when they're teaching or running a business or what have you. But I think luckily for me, somehow I landed with the psychology that puts me in the opposite box. So I won't question that too much. and I'll hold on to it. Well, you have been just uh, a wealth of information for us. Does anybody have any other questions that they would like to ask Emily? Yes. Okay. Um, I, it looks like there's one from Judy. Yeah, um, that's my question. I wanted to know what the population of the island was and what percentage of the population are these women? I do not know that off the top of my head. Are they... Uh -huh. I was trying to figure out, are the, the majority of the working class women there? Um, let's see. So Jeju, I'm just looking this up to get the number for the um, number of people who live there. Um, their population is 700,000. Well, so not too many people. Um, and in terms of the... Um, the makeup of the gender makeup. Um, you know, I will say that anecdotally, I know that Hong's, some of Hong's relatives, um, they had not traveled outside of Korea before, but some of them had gone to work in um, Saudi Arabia as, I don't want to say indentured servants, but that's what they are. Uh, 
that's maybe that is the correct term for it. So um, I'm not sure there's a ton of work on the island for men. Um, like I said, tourism is a huge, huge industry on the island these days. Um, as I mentioned in the book, Jeju did not industrialize. They didn't build factories there. Um, and there's, of course, squid fishing. There's a hanyeo and tourism and farming and the tangerine crop, which is also mentioned in the book when they planted those tangerines and um, use that as an economic driver for the island. Um, I'm looking up the, um, the gender composition of the island these days, because I mean, as we saw in the book 60 years ago, many, many of the men um, died. Um, one second. Hmm. Well, according to Jeju Weekly, which is the English language publication there, um, there are now slightly more men than women on the island for the first time in decades, which is quite interesting. So um, I guess finally the population has balanced out a bit after all the horrors of the 20th century. Thank you. Emily, that leads me to another question. Did you find that the men were still watching the children and supporting the women like they did in the book? Um, that was not as much my impression. Um, I think in, and I think this there, I think they touch on this in the book too, that um, as Jeju became more like the rest of Korea and opened up a little bit more um, to the mainland, the gender role started to shift a little bit to what we would consider to be a little bit more traditional. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that um, it's, it's not quite the way it was in 1940 anymore in that respect. But the men, and I thought that was interesting when I did a little bit of research about the henya, it started out as a man's profession. Mm -hmm. and because of the, I think the, they said that the Japanese were, were able to tax the men more than they were the women. Mm -hmm. So there were, there were a couple things. They were able to tax the men higher than the women and the women had more body fat so they could stay warmer if they mm -hmm. dove during the cold months. And they were able to hold their breath longer, the women were. So the men got away from it. So it doesn't seem that the men are back into becoming henyas now. No, no. So I, I guess they're doing the farming or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. stores or whatever are there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it seems to me that at this point, um, the the female aspect of the Hanyeo tradition is so ingrained in the cultural imagination that even if men wanted to, it would be hard to, to make that happen. Um, Cause it's just so much a part of both what the Hanyeo themselves think of, but also what the tourists think of and what the people of Jeju think of. It's just become a cultural tradition at this point. Um, but yeah, Joan, it's interesting. It doesn't seem to me that there's any, from my research, that there's any definitive answer about why this became a woman only profession, but some of the reasons you cited are definite um, possibilities that the taxation question, the body fat, um, men were busy fighting in wars. Um, so yeah, at some point it became a female only profession. Were you able to go to the museum? I know um, Lisa C has talked about the, they have a museum now where the, there are women that reenact the, the songs, like you said, were you mm -hmm. able to see the museum and the pictures? Um, I did not go see the museum. I believe Hong didn't like the museum, so she didn't want to take me there. Uh, um, so unfortunately, um, I did not get a chance to go there. I, I thought that was interesting that obviously the government, um, they, they do think that this way of life is important enough to have made a museum mm -hmm. and that they're you know the the best Hanye their their photographs are there and their story mm -hmm. is there and I guess that's another big tourist attraction so for sure which may be why Hong didn't like it <laughs> um, I also when I was there people were very excited that the Hanyeo had received a UNESCO World Heritage um, designation because that meant that they had this official measure of value from the world community so people were very happy that um, that they'd received that recognition. Well I'm, I'm glad that they that Marilyn chose this book sometimes I don't find that every year the books are as interesting yeah, you know, that you don't always like the book as much as you did a, a book in the past. But this one, I think that there's so much that people can learn. And like you said, I didn't know about the Hanye and, and you said you had never known about that culture. 
Mm-hmm. And I think we've lear- learned a little bit about an island in South Korea. So mm-hmm. it, it gave us a bit of information to absorb while also enjoying a very good story. So for any of you that haven't read the book, we, have, we still have copies at the library. So I suggest that you, you reserve yourself a copy as soon as you can, but it, because it's very good. So does anybody else have any questions? Well, I think that's it, Emily. I, I appreciate you joining us tonight. I think this is, has been just wonderful. It's, it's great to hear about your experience traveling there. And, I, you know, I, I don't think I'll ever get a chance to go there, but I certainly would like to go there and see it. So thank you very much. Never say thank never. <laughs> and and um, hearing your pictures, they were beautiful. Yeah. Of course. Thank you. And um, Joan, thank you so much again for contacting me and for having me and um, for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work and my um, time on this fabulous, intriguing island. Um, And thank you to all of you for um, listening and um, participating in this. And um, if you need, if you have any follow-up questions for me or, you know, think of something tomorrow, then feel free to email me through my website. I'll um, drop that in the chat actually, if anybody wants my email address, it's on there. Um, So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you to Joan and to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. You didn't have to do this for us and I really appreciate it. It was, it was a wealth of information. So thank you. We really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you, Joan. Thank you. You're welcome.